We know how the fix and flip game works. We always see our private lender making money. Even if we had deals that we broke even on or even lost money on, he made his money. He was getting paid every single time. We would pay him off with no issues. And we're like, you know what? We, we want to be like this guy. So let's start lending out money. Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with Solomon Sulemanov. Now, Solomon is the co-founder and director at WeLend, a tech-based private lending platform revolutionizing private lending space and providing quick and low-cost capital to the real estate investors nationwide. They have reviewed over 4,000 loan applications and funded about 1,000 loans worth approximately $400 million since being founded in 2018. They're an online loan processing, takes less than three to seven days, and they lend up to 90% of the property purchase and up to 100% of the construction with rates as low as 8.5%. Solomon got his start way back when he was 21 years of age, focusing primarily on fix and flips. And that's how he got into this business. And we're actually just talking about a little bit in the green room about the evolution of being a fix and flipper and always understanding that the lender gets paid regardless of how you do on your deal. And so he became a lender. And now here he is today at WeLend. So I'm really pumped and excited to have him on the show today to share his incredible knowledge. But enough of me, let's get him out here. G'day, Solomon. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? mate. Doing great, Reed. Thank you so much for having me here. Mate, I was geeking out with you a little bit early on. We'll get into it, you know, in this show. But for the listeners, uh, at RSN, which is my platform, uh, we, we buy large multifamily. Um, but we also have employed with private lending in this sort of the fix and flip space. And we launched actually a private money platform early this year. So it's really new and exciting to me opening up other things in our business and you being at the forefront of we're at the coalface, I should say, for the last seven years in the private money, you know, space, understanding that is uh, really in paramount. And I, I had a lot of questions for you already, which I'll have more questions for you later on in the show. But before we get into that, can you rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid? Oh, absolutely. First ever dollar I made as a kid. That's a great question. So I initially, I, I'm a gearhead and I'm, I'm wearing actually a, a McLaren F1 shirt right now. So I, I love cars. I love Formula One. You know, when I was younger as a kid, I, I, I thought, um, you know, I, I was going to become a pharmacist and go to pharmacy school. And, and do all that good stuff. I worked at a pharmacy for a few years. I was like, all right, this is definitely not for me. So I, I ended up leaving and I was like, listen, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty hands-on with cars. Let me, you know, let me open up like a mini mechanic shop in my parents' backyard. My first client was my coworker at the time where she had a car that she was looking to, to repair. And I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll do a, a full service job for you for, I don't know, I think maybe it was like a thousand bucks. And maybe, you know, it cost me about like, you know, two or $300 in parts for me to be able to, you know, to, to, to get the car back up and running. So that was actually probably one of the first, uh, first times that I, I made a buck on my own where, you know, I, I made the decisions as to, you know, what I'm doing with, with the project and, and how I'm going to get to the finish line. I, I slowly found out, well, not slowly, I quickly found out I, I probably should not open up a mechanic shop and it is not for me. There's a long story behind it, but I still made, I still really got it to the finish line. Still gave her the car, but then I, I reached out to to my brother and my cousin who were already in real estate. They just started on their own, and they were pretty much door knocking on properties to see if you know these people want to you know sellers would want to sell their homes. A lot of these people are like in financial distress, so I, I ended up joining and we, we were acquiring properties in uh, the New York City area. So, but yeah, the, the first time I started, I, I made a buck on my own was when I when I had a, a mini mechanic shop. I'm going to butcher your last name. I've already butchered it. Where, where, where are you guys from originally? What's your, where's your heritage? So I was born here and my parents migrated from the former Soviet Union. The country was Turkmenistan. So it borders Iran and it borders Afghanistan. Um, so I still have some, you know, I have family from Iran. I have some family from Afghanistan and Turkmenistan, but we were like only one of the few Jews within that region. And then, you know, once the Soviet Union fell in 1990, my parents were able to, my, my parents, my great grand, uh, my grandparents were, were able to migrate over to, to the States. Um, and the first place we hit was uh, New York City. And I was born and raised here. And I don't think I'm ever leaving. No, that's awesome. No, I lo love the first generation American story and coming from, you know, uh, 
people migrating from from war torn countries and just having you know you're back against the wall. It's 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 a great story. There's so many people on this podcast that I talk to. I'm you know I don't come from those circumstances, but I've definitely uh, did you know come and chase a girl over here. So different <laughs> different migration stories, but you know trying to make it work in a, in a new country. And yeah. I, I think that that expat mentality and mindset for anyone um, coming to a new country and just saying, look, this is it's either this or nothing. So uh, burn the bridges, as they say, or burn the boats, and um, you know make it make it happen. So that is freaking yeah. awesome. So talk us about the evolution of um, the private money lending. You we spoke in the green room before pressing record here that you've spent a lot of time fixing and flipping. You just mentioned you joined, I believe it was your brothers, right? Right, your cousins, yeah. um, uh, in the in the space. So where did it start, and why did you eventually go down the path of lending and not keep doing the fix and flipping world? Yeah, I mean, I, I joined in 2013 at that time. My brother and my, my two cousins were already getting started in the industry. But before that, I mean, it's a long story before that, too. I mean, I, and when I was in high school, I was um, I was working at the shop where my cousin was working, where, you know, they were doing loan modifications for people right after the the financial crisis. Right. So a lot of people were underwater and distressed. They weren't able to afford their mortgage. So this company was providing relief in a sense where they're able to modify their mortgage, lower their you know interest rates. Because as you and I both know, you know, and with with the you know the great financial crisis, a lot of these people were you know in a mortgage where their rates just jumped you know overnight. Literally, they were paying maybe like four percent, and it went to like eight percent or nine percent. They were no longer able to afford it. So I was I was working at a loan modification shop there with my cousin. Got out of that. I thought it wasn't for me. I was cold calling. I'm like, I I don't like this stuff at all. Um, And then I did the pharmacy thing. I I had a mechanic shop and then I I reached out to my brother and my cousin. I'm like, listen, I I want to join in. And that was like either 2012 or 2013. At the time they were ramping up to you know start buying up distressed real estate in the boroughs. Um, so I joined in, was door knocking on people's homes in Brooklyn and in Queens and in, in the Bronx. And this is before, you know, like YouTube showed you how to be a salesperson, how to, you know, how to generate leads, how to go out there and, and, and you know, bring in this type of business. So it was a lot of hands on learning. I, I also learned a lot from my from my older cousin, Ruben, where he, you know, he's been in sales for almost all his life. Uh, you know, it showed me the ropes as well. So it helped me out there. But yeah, man, I mean, that's how I got started. You know, I was door knocking, literally people's doors, trying to see if they want to sell. A lot of people, you know, uh, would either one want to fight you, they're screaming at you, you know, they're doing all these crazy things. And I mean, you can also understand where they're coming from because they're in distress. It's either, you know, their property's about to get foreclosed on or, or they're about to, you know, start falling behind on their mortgage and they can't really afford the home. So they're under a lot of stress. So you need to figure out a way for you to be able to, you know, to, to sit down with them and, and try to either pitch them to, you know, remodify their home or either sell their property. So 2013, I came around there, started doing that. We started buying up a, a ton of properties in the boroughs. Uh, we were fixing and flipping. We were developing. But initially, we were really flipping our contracts, right? We were wholesaling. So we, we would enter into contract with a seller, let's say, hypothetically speaking, for 500000 we would find an investor that was willing to pay us six hundred fifty thousand dollars. You know, we would flip the contract. You know, make our quick hundred fifty thousand dollars and move on to the next deal. Eventually, we grew up and we understood how the whole entire concept works with fix and flips. And then we we started fixing and flipping properties on our own. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get introduced to a um, to a private lender that was there for us. It was an old school type of guy. Literally, did no appraisals. You know, didn't, didn't do anything. He looked at the property. He's like, hey, what's the address? He pulls up to the home. You're there. You're walking through the deal with him. You're talking about the numbers. He's like, you know what? I like the area. I like the numbers. Let me know when you're entering into contract or when you need to close. I have the money ready for you. So on average, you know, they were, you know, he was financing us anywhere from like 80 to 100% of the acquisition price and 100% for the construction cost. Um, at the time we were borrowing money, we were paying anywhere from like 14 to like 18% on that money. Um, so it was like 14% on the rate and like two or three points on the origination fee, you know, and at that time there was not much competition in the, in the private lending space. It was still called, you know, hard money lending. 
literally an old school guy that pulls up in his, you know, white S class, looks at the deal, looks at the property and gives you the green light or says, Hey, sorry guys, you know, this deal is not for me. We had him by our side throughout the whole entire, you know, acquisitions, you know, throughout all of our acquisitions, he, he liked us, you know, and, and he trusted us. So we had a really good track record with him. Come 2018, you know, we started seeing deals get more tight because there was a lot more competition that was coming into the, into the space. You know, people were becoming more aware as to how real estate works, how the fix and flip space works, et cetera. So it was getting tougher to find good deals. So we were like, you know what? We know how the fix and flip game works. You know, we always see our private lender making money, even if we had deals that we broke even on or even lost money on. He made his money. You know, he was getting paid every single time, every single month. We would pay him off with no issues. And we're like, you know what? We we want to be like this guy, you know? So we're like, you know, let's let's start lending out money. So we, in 2018, we decided to start lending money. Our first loan, I believe, was in Queens, where, where I was actually born and raised in. You know, from there, it, it, it's history. You know, we've been in the uh, private lending space for about six years. Well, six years now. Uh, we lent over $500 million to date. You know, we're, we're expanding our programs. We're expanding the, the states that we're lending in. You know, we initially started in New York City. And then we started expanding, going to like Jersey, going into Connecticut, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Florida. I personally love this side of the industry because now, you know, a lot of these, you know, competitors when we were fixing flippers uh, became, you know, our clients and a lot of them became our friends as well. And now I'm able to, you know, they, they send over deals to our team and I'm able to just sit there and just see how all these deals are playing out and what their thought process is and how they're structuring it and how they're able to bring it to the table, which I, I really appreciate and, and I love seeing. That's awesome. No, like it's such a great story and of coming through the road, you know, get, earning your stripes, but then identifying an area where there's always grass is always going to be greener, right? There's always going to be the someone in the, in the deal is going to have the easier, um, process you know i've fixed and flip houses I've, I've borrowed from hard money lenders back in 2013 2014 in philly actually same sort of thing the guy would drive past and say yeah i think this is a deal how much are you going to put down and, and let's go but in saying that as as i've now discovered you know hard money lending or private money lending it's maybe hard money lending is a bad word uh is is being become very very popular particularly in you know, in in companies like mine, where RSN, you know, we 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 raise money for multifamily deals, but you know, we don't have multifamily deals all the time, and so we got to have to have maybe an evergreen content to it to keep investors' cash moving. And hard money lending is a great you know platform for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the structure because I know a little bit more than the average bear on how this stuff works. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you partner up with the warehouse lines of credit, you know, and how that all sort of looks in the capital stack when you're doing this hard money lending? Because someone you hear someone saying five hundred million dollars of loans, you think, wow, you've had access to five hundred million dollars worth of investor investors' dollars to go and put on the street. It's not right. actually like that, right? So talk talk to us a little bit about not necessarily the secret source, but how it also is structured to to go to get to get to that scale. When we initially started, we were not balance sheet lenders at all, right? So a lot of these loans that we were originating, we were selling to the secondary market the second we originated that loan. So let's say I, I read, I gave you a loan for a million bucks, you know, that million dollars, I would need to replenish as soon as I could, right? Because we didn't start off with a lot of capital in our fund, right? Maybe we started off like a million or two dollars, one, one to two million dollars is what we like really started with. And we're like, all right, you know, we want to originate way more than one to two million dollars because in new york city one one acquisition is like a million bucks and like you know a construction cost here is like about three to five hundred thousand dollars so like all right this is going to make zero sense if we're only doing one loan a month makes no sense so we figured out there we figured out that there are are secondary markets out there where you have like hedge funds and and wall street out there looking for this yield they're hungry for this yield right we're lending money at anywhere from like 11 to 12 percent and that's what they're really looking for. You know, they're looking for, you know, loans where they can clip 10% or maybe 9%. You know, we make the yield spread on, on, on the on the rate, on the coupon. And then we also charge an origination fee. So we were able to plug ourselves in with those, with those buyers. I give you that million dollar loan. The next day I sell it to them right away. So I replenish that million dollars and I'm able to lend it back out 
on the street again. So our rate of return gets juiced up so much more than just lending out that million dollars and just collecting that 12% on an annual basis. Now I'm lending out that million dollars maybe three or four times. So that's how we initially started in 2018. A few years ago, when we started getting warehouse lines where now we're balance sheeting these loans, right? So let's say I'm balance sheeting this month about $10 million. I, I go to this warehouse line and they, they're advancing me about 70% or, or even sometimes 80% on that $10 million. So now I'm able to replenish either seven, seven to $8 million of my balance sheet. And, and I'm able to go out there and, and, and lend that money back out on the street. Yep. Um, and I mean, look, the beauty of being a balance sheet lender, uh, rather than just trading loans all day, is as a balance sheet lender, you, you're able to create your own box of the type of loans that you want to lend on. You have more flexibility on the type of deals that you can lend on. Right. There are many private lenders right now that are just stuck in a box of uh, the type of loans that they're they're able to lend to. Right. So like typically on average, you know, majority of private lenders are lending on your typical one to four unit value add projects and they're not lending on anything else. And they're right off the bat, you know, being a seasoned um, lender, I, I can understand that they don't have a balance sheet. All they're doing really is recycling their capital and just selling these loans off to the secondary market. Uh, we have a bit of a hybrid approach where we do sell loans and we also have a balance sheet. So with, with the balance sheet, now I'm able to lend on multifamily. I'm able to lend on an industrial property. I'm able to lend on luxury properties, right? Like last week, we lent on a um, on a luxury single family home in on East 48th Street in Manhattan, right? I was, it was a very well-known architect. That built the property back in 1856. This, you know, this this hedge fund guy actually purchased the property. Uh, was in mid construction, then had some issue with his current private lender, and then his loan matured. So he started looking for a new private lender. So he stumbled across us. He's like, "Listen, dude. He's like, I went through a dozen private lenders. None of these guys could get me to the finish line. You know, what differentiates you from them?" And I told him, "I'm a balance sheet lender." You know, I'm able to take a look at this deal. I'm able to hold this deal on my books and I'm pretty much able to do whatever I want with these type of loans. It's not like these these guys where where they have to stick within that guideline, one to four units, no luxury homes, no bridge to bridge refinances, no mid construction projects. Um, so that's that's really the big difference between the two. Uh, we got him to the finish line. We got him to the closing table. He's, uh, you know, happy more than ever. It was about a $4 million loan. We gave him a million dollars towards construction, and then we gave him about, um, I think it was like about $3 million towards his uh, current payoff with his other lender. Gotcha. Uh, and, yeah. And how much does of that with the warehouse, you know, do you leverage up to in any in, in that sort of scenario to give you that flexibility to be a balance sheet lender? So for that specific deal, our, our warehouse lender leveraged us 65%. Gotcha. And what are you paying this? Uh, the, the, what are you paying them? Um, we are at Sofer plus, I think we're at Sofer plus 500. Okay. So, so yeah, that's, that's, you know, it's 10%, right? Yeah. To, so you, and then you're putting it on the street at 12 or 13. Yeah. So you're, you're taking that spread, but you're also putting equity in the deal because, well, you know, when I say equity, equity from your investors into that loan to bridge right. that remaining 35, 30 to 35%, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's and then what? What sort of loan, what sort of returns are you te- uh, paying out your equity on, or you know, in that stack? You just read my mind. I was about to actually comment on that. So anywhere from like twelve to fifteen percent returns to our investors right now this month. Yeah. So annually, once you calculate it annually, it, 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 uh, it equals to fifteen percent, and we pay them monthly as well. So there's monthly distributions. Um, some months you'll get one point. Some months you'll get you know point and a half, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. And then you yeah. keep what, and you're keeping the origination, right? Right. We keep the origination. You know, we, there is also an asset management fee that we charge. I think it's about like two percent, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, we we typically keep the origination fees and all that, all the all, all the other fees, and then they they get the yield. Got, okay, so they're getting the spread between you know the, the note on the street and 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 what you're paying your, right. your bridge your bridge lender. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's that's fantastic. And uh, how often or how long are your loans typically out on the street for? So on average, our loans are out on the street for about anywhere from uh, seven to eight months. Okay. 
Yep. And are you are you maxing it out at twelve months or eighteen months? Like, do you you not, not like to go a certain period of time over? So our fix and flip loans, the the bridge loans, are for twelve months. But then, of course, you know you have some borrowers that are building properties ground up, and you know twelve months really doesn't suffice for them. So we give them an eighteen month term loan, and a lot of these guys are seasoned. So they're pretty much done by like month 12 and they're either refinancing it into a term loan or they're just, you know, trading the property altogether. Mm-hmm. And ha- have you seen the last, you know, two and a half years with the, with the run up in, in Fed rate, ha- did that slow down your lending practice because construction deals didn't pencil anymore? Absolutely. It, the last two years were tough, man. Last two years were really tough. It, it wasn't easy for a lot of us. You know, in the private lending industry, a lot of us are friends. It is friendly competition. So we do talk to each other anytime we see each other in like these trade shows, you know, these other meetings like the NPLA meeting. So a lot of us do talk and everyone had the same exact thing. Everyone's like, listen, our production is down anywhere from like 40 to 60 percent. You know, we were within that range as well. A lot of deals in New York City were just slowly not going anywhere. Everyone was trying to push out their contracts as much as possible because, these investors had no idea where, you know, these rates are going. And a lot of people that were purchasing homes were afraid because, you know, over literally overnight, the Fed just raised the rates. You know, people were paying, you know, anywhere from like two to four percent. Now the rates are up like, you know, five to seven or eight percent. I remember we were we originated a, a term loan. I don't, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but we originated a term loan in 2021. It was a 30 year loan, five arm. And we gave our borrower a 3.875% rate. I was looking at that. I'm like, I don't think I will ever see it ever again. Um, it, w- it was great times. We were super busy. But then, yeah, the past two years were really tough. You know, the construction cost obviously also has been going up through the roof. I'm sure you know that with inflation. But now it's slowly easing out. Um, there are a lot of constraints, too, with, with supply which also, you know, drove up prices on appliances and other construction. But in general, overall, the construction cost has definitely gone up. And a lot of guys were afraid to, to pull triggers in the past two years. I would personally call our, you know, top borrowers and I would try to get a you know sense of as to what they're doing. And they're all, they would all tell me the exact same thing. Like, Sal, we are on the sidelines until we understand what's really happening in this market. They're like, we're afraid mm-hmm. to pull the trigger because we don't want to get stuck with the bag. And I, I really don't blame them. And I, I personally feel like right now, the people that are stuck with the bag are some people that, you know, acquired properties at the top of the market in 22. A lot of it being like mixed use and multifamily properties. I'm sure you've seen it as well in your world where, you know, people were, you know, penciling exits, you know, 4% rates. And now that's like doubled and they're stuck with assets where, the, you know, the values are maybe shaved in half, if not more, in some cases. Um, do, do you think that uh, there's there's elements of 2008 in, in the commercial multifamily space today? Because you mentioned earlier the loan mods where, like, people would wake up and be like, oh, I was paying 3 and 4%, now I'm paying 8 It's like, that's what's happening today. <laughs> in a very different way, I don't think it's similar to, that, to 2008. I feel like the people... In today's market are a little bit more understanding and the type of people that are buying these investments are actual operators as opposed to what it was like in 2008 where a majority of the people were, you know, your your typical homeowner that, you know, maybe had one or two homes, you know, had a decent job to, you know, to, to be able to afford the mortgage. Now, I feel like it's more of like speculators and, you know, they... I don't want to say they know how to navigate through these waters, but if you're a seasoned sponsor, you know what you're doing, you're, you'll be able to navigate through the waters, especially if you have sufficient liquidity. And I think that's the most important thing in today's market is having that liquidity behind you to be able to keep up with those payments for you to be able to just keep that property and, and not lose it. Because I, I've seen many scenarios where right now in the city, I, I know a developer where he has a note that's maturing on a hotel. Um, in Soho, where the note maturing, uh, the note is at two hundred fifty million dollars, but in today's market, the property is only worth about one hundred eighty million dollars. And you know, the guy thankfully has sufficient liquidity where he's able to do principal buy downs, and he's speaking to the current lender, and he's like, "Hey, do me a favor. You really need to extend this loan because if you do take me into foreclosure, 
neither one of us are winning anything. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, a lot of these lenders are like, you know what, you know, we'll, we'll extend it. You know, they, they give them an extension and they, they let them figure out the, the, the issues and they let them refi or have a principal buy down, but they want to make sure that they do get paid at the end of the day. So I feel like it's a very different from what, from what it was in 2008. Do you think the distress is coming? And do you think that 2008, like my opinion is that 2008 was an American dream problem. Today, yeah. it's like big developer problem. And it's like, well, you, you're big boys and girls. You should have known better. Yeah. And that part, I, yeah, I, I agree with the latter where it's like, you know, you're, you're a big boy. You know what you're doing. You, you know, you got a bit too aggressive with your underwriting and your assumptions. Um, and, you know, you're, you're going to have to hold the bag. But the issue there is that a lot of these multifamily loans have no personal guarantees behind them. So I, I think that's also an issue. But the bigger so issue, you, I feel like there's a lot it's of these, coming? It's definitely coming. I, I think it's coming. I don't know if it's going to be similar to 2008, where there's going to be a lot of it. But I, I, I definitely do feel like it's coming. And I'm, I'm already seeing now with the office market. I'm sure you see it too. You know, I've seen people hand about keys already. Like that's that's already starting yeah. to happen. Valuations are down. To your point, if you don't have liquidity or you can't do a capital call and negotiate with the bank, you're you're screwed. Like I know operators in the multifamily space who've got multiple deals that can't they can't rewrite the ship on, and they're just saying here's here's the keys back. So, you know, if you're listening to this, it is already playing out in real time. You know, there there is, and that's not, and I'm assuming that's also with your private money lending, right? Have you had many defaults recently? You know, thankfully, we, you know, the majority of the multifamily loans that we did originate, we traded to the secondary market. But the multifamily loans that we did originate to the secondary market, we still keep track of. We want to see, you know, what the performance is like for these operators. And right now, I would want to say. I would say like five percent of them are in default, five or six percent, which is not that high. Uh, a lot of these guys are seasoned; they have sufficient liquidity. I know many lenders that became extremely aggressive in the past couple of years, where they just wanted to win over the deals. You know, they 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 close their eyes on the liquidity, they close their eyes on the sponsor's track record. They gave them extremely high leverages. And we we lost a lot of deals because of that. And we always stood our ground and we're like, listen. We don't want to pass through, our, you know, we we don't want to step on our own guidelines and shoot ourselves in the foot. You know, we want to see sufficient liquidity. We want to see a good sponsor. We want to see a good track record. That was always our motto. That was always very important to us. Thankfully, we followed it. Obviously, there's still some bad apples out there where five or six percent is still not something that we would want to see. But that's, you know, that's the nature of the business. I, I know some people where they have, you know, defaults, you know, 15 to 20 percent, if not above. Some guys just closing up shop altogether because... They, they lent out so much money to these multifamily guys where, you know, their exposure was just so much to them that they, they're not getting payoffs and they just don't have new, new liquidity coming in from, from their investors into the fund. And they're like, you know, we, we got to shut down. Yep. No, I think it's, it's here or it's yeah. you know, slowly coming. The cracks are already starting to form. And um, right now is you can be picking up some pretty good money, uh, pretty good deals if you can get them at the right basis and you can get equity exactly. on board. So yeah, it's it's if you're listening to it, right now is a great time to be buying uh, a multifamily real estate in particular, you know, a lot of a lot, amongst other asset classes where people where lenders got uh, aggressive, where sponsors got aggressive and now they they're underwater and paying double, uh, you know, going into a 4% interest rate and now they're paying 8. So um but Solomon, at the end of every show, we love to dive in the top 5 investing tips. Um you ready to get into it? Let's do it. Mate, question number one, what is the daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? I have a to-do list that I go through on a daily basis. Make sure that I, I check off everything that I have on there throughout the day. Obviously, I, I don't get through everything, but I, I do make sure that I have the my number one most important task gets done in the beginning of the day. That's That's the most important part for me. Love it. Question number two is who's been the most influential person in your career to date? I love Elon Musk, man. I love what he does. Whatever he's been doing for the past 20 to 30 years, my background does come from uh, computer science. I am, you know, I'm a geek when it comes to that. Um, and what he's done to revolutionize so many industries is just amazing. I mean, you got SpaceX, you have Tesla, what he did with PayPal. I, it's just amazing. 
Love it. Question number three is, in your business, is there an influential tool that you can't run the business without? When I say tool, it could be a physical tool like a, a journal or a phone, or it could be like a piece of software that you just can't seem to run the day-to-day without it. What is it? Uh, two things. One is a CRM, and one another, of course, is your phone. You know, sales is the key in any business. Sales and marketing really is key. But yeah, I, I would say cold calling. If you're out there, if you're just starting in real estate and you're trying to figure out how do I get this done, get over your fear of cold calling. I, I think that's one of the most underrated things in, in this world is cold calling and sales, man. I, I think that's very important. You're selling whatever you do in this life. You're always selling something. You're selling yourself, you know, to, to you know, get through that next stage in your life or, you know, buy the next piece of property. Question number four is in one sentence, what's been the biggest failure in your career? What'd you learn from that failure? There's a few that I've had that I've learned from. And I feel like without failure, there is no success. Um, organization and delegation, I think it's huge. De- and big emphasis on the delegation portion where I tried doing everything all on my own. And I just got to the point where I was overwhelmed. I wasn't able to sit and, and focus on things that I really needed to focus on. And I was just doing the day in and day out stuff, which I, which I really could probably delegate it over to someone on my team. And, and you know, rather than doing that, I did it on my own and just get burnt out. Thankfully, now I, I, I am able to, to sit there and, and delegate what I, what, I, what I need. So delegation. Love it. Last question, mate, is where can people reach you to continue the conversation that will be in your sphere? Where do they go? So you can reach us via Instagram at Wheeland LLC. You can reach us via email with uh, info at WheelandLLC.com. If you want to reach out to me personally, Solomon WheelandLLC.com is my email address. Or my Instagram, Sal, S-A-L underscore Solomons. Um, you can DM me. I, I pretty pretty much always available. And of course, on LinkedIn, uh, you'll, you'll be able to find me under my full name, Solomon Solomonov. You can send out a message and I'll, I'll be able to reply there as well. Awesome. All right, mate. Well, look, I want to thank you so much for taking some time out of your day. I just want to reflect some of the things that I took away from today's show. I think, you know, the ability to understand where we are in the market cycle is being is, is really affected everyone right now. Like and if you didn't catch what Solomon said earlier, guys, it's been slow, not only in the multifamily space, not only in the lending space, not only in the fix and fi- flipping space. It has been slow for a long period of time. Like I'm talking over two years. When interest rates go from nearly zero to five, over 5%, you don't think that it sounds like a lot, but it is a massive handbrake on the co- economy and understand that it is causing breaking points today, right? We are at a point where there's opportunities to be made. Blood is in the street. I'm seeing it right now. Yeah. Solomon's seeing it right now. You need to act if you want to start getting into this business regardless. So reach out to Solomon if you have any questions. But I want to say, Solomon, that is what I took away from today's show. It's great to hear other people at the coal face seeing things and being that canary in the coal mine. But uh, rewind six, seven months ago, 12 months ago, we would probably both be sitting here twiddling our thumbs going, yeah. what the hell are we going to do to make money, right? Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. now it's an opportunity to really pounce. Um, but did I leave anything out with well, that little summary? No, I think you're, you hit it on the head. Uh, all my guys that were on the sidelines are now coming back onto the field. Like you said, they're seeing the blood on the streets. They're making sharky offers. There are people there that are not able to afford these properties anymore or underwater. They're taking these offers because they just have no choice. They don't have the liquidity to withstand these deals. So if you are an investor that has been on the sidelines for the past few years, now is definitely the time to come back in, see what the market's like. Throw in that sharky offer, right? If they list a property at X amount, you know, if they list it for like a million bucks, it does not hurt for you to go out there and, and give them a shark you offer of like six, seven hundred thousand dollars because you really don't know what their situation is like. I've seen numerous cases like that whenever, you know, our borrowers come to us with these loans. I see the property listed for a million bucks, but they're in contract for six or seven hundred thousand dollars. And they have these nice deals that are coming in. I'm like, finally, I'm seeing deals that make sense. These guys are making money. Everyone's getting ha- happy. And and obviously, unfortunately, there are some guys that, you know, are 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 hurting, but, you know, that's that's the name of the game. And if you do it smart, you're not too aggressive, I think you'll, you'll make a great amount of money. I completely agree. Well, look, mate, I want to thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to tune in, or not even to tune in, to come on the show and give us your awesome insights into what you've been doing. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. There's been a lot of awesome nuggets in here. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll catch up very, very soon. Thank you, Reed. I appreciate it.
Well, there you have another cracking episode jam-packed with some incredible advice from Solomon. Please check him out at all his socials at welend.com. He has a lot of off, a lot of great stuff to offer in terms of insights into the lending space and really understanding those red flags that are coming out in the real world right now. It's happening today, as I mentioned before. So please be on the lookout for awesome opportunities to start investing today. It could be 08 again. I don't think it's going to be as bad as 08, but it could be similar hallmarks of what we saw back there. Distressed sellers that need to get out of properties because of higher interest rates. So get out, start underwriting deals and start hunting those deals today. And don't forget, making sure that you're doing the old school guerrilla marketing. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone call and make those offers. It's so, so important. But again, I want to thank you all for taking some time out of your day to tune in to continue to grow your financial IQ. It's what we're all about here on this show. If you like this show, the easiest way to give back is one, share it with your friends. Make sure everyone is listening to it. Number two, give it a five-star review on iTunes. And we're going to do this all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave and go give life a crack. 